Great. Thank you very much, Catherine. So now I'm pleased to uh, begin the main event. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Jesper Cole. Uh, he's been researching and investing in Japan since 1986 and has served as the head of research or chief economist at several leading financial institutions. His next position is really a closely held secret, as you can tell from his deep tan. He is in between <laughs> jobs right now. But I'm pleased after so many years of advoca advocating for more labor mobility in Japan that he is leading by example. <laughs> Not done, no. You're not done. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, Jesper's kindly participated in this event for many years, and I know that many of us in the room have appreciated his insights and you know, optimism each year. I always walk out much more uh, with a, really a jump and a hop in my step than uh, before I come in. So this year's presentation comes at a really critical moment for Abenomics. Uh, to me, it seems that the Abe administration's made very visible progress in several areas, corporate governance, uh, some others, you know, the corporate governance code, the stewardship code are very encouraging. Other areas, including uh, you know, labor policies and like, which are more difficult, but for Jesper, um, seem to be taking more time. And there do seem to be some cracks, perhaps opening up in the fiscal and monetary policy as well. So you know, with, at this point, you know, we're, I think Jesper's comments will help give guidance to, uh, to all of us over the next year, and I'm pleased to hand over the microphone. Great. Um, so thank you very much for the kind introduction, and, and thank you very much for your continued uh, support. I think this is the 15th time that I give this talk, um, and I'm incredibly happy to see you know, such an incredible diversity um, you know, of people. There's many more women than uh, what happened 15 years ago, and also there's many more young people, uh, which is very good, because quite frankly, you know, when you give these sort of talks in front of the Kedan Ren, you know, um, I feel very young. And as you know, <laughs> um, one of the reasons I love being in Japan is because everybody else seems to be getting older faster than I do. <laughs> now, I want to talk a little bit about a new Japanese golden age. I mean, I, I find it very difficult to control myself in my optimism at this point in time. And I, I, I will tell you, I hate Abenomics. Because you remember last year I told you I hate Abenomics because I never had to work so hard in my life. Last year, all of a sudden, Japan was back in, fas in fashion. In my world, the world of money, all of a sudden we were back at having midnight conference calls with unsuspecting investors who, you know, literally a couple of years ago couldn't care less about Japan. Now I hate Abenomics because I'm actually abandoning my secure job at, you know, one of the big global financial institutions, um, and I'm actually jumping in to uh, launch an American asset management boutique uh, here in Tokyo, and we're going to launch our Asia strategy from Tokyo. So, you know, I feel a bit like an old Japanese guy, um, you know, because they are very scared, but I hope that we can have, you know, with your support, you know, um, you know indeed be a little bit of an example of uh, what's going on here. Now, why should you be bullish? I mean, first of all, you know, there's a cycle, and then there is a structure. And when you look at the business cycle in Japan, I mean, I'm sorry, things are not going to get better than they are right now. You have this year, 2015, for the first time in basically 25 years, for the first time, the Japanese economy, the Japanese private sector is going to be let free. There is no distortion from the government side. Monetary policy is basically stable. The big changes that happened two years ago are now running their way through the system. And also fiscal policy, both on the tax side as well as on the spending side, for the first time in 25 years is actually neutral. Last year, we obviously had this big distortion 
with the changes in the tax system. So 2015, for the first time in literally one generation, the Japanese economy, Japan's entrepreneurs, Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, the Japanese consumer, for the first time in one generation, are going to be left alone. And what do economies do? What do human beings do when they are left alone? They actually grow. They do want to have a better future. And you see that this is exactly what is unfolding right now. If you need a prediction, I believe that over the next three years, the Japanese economy, Japan's GDP, can very well grow at a rate of 2 to 2.5%. Two and, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that the government actually has gone out of the way. Now, when people talk about economics, they basically try to bamboozle you. You know, they talk about consumption expenditure, they talk about investment expenditure, they talk about housing, they talk about central banks, and it's all very complicated. It's all mumbo jumbo. One thing that you guys as practitioners, and you are all practitioners, you live in the real world, you don't live in some economic textbook. What you need to know, and what you know as a business person, is look at the metabolism. You know about economics, land, labor, capital. Unless you're a Middle Eastern oil-rich economy, that's your assets, that's your factors of production. The metabolism in Japan is up, as in way up. Land. You're a young man. Where are you going to buy real estate? We're going to buy in Where, the city. In the city. Where? Don't say Washington DC where you're going to university. The answer is Tokyo. Okay. Now, Tokyo, when you look at real estate transactions, did you know that you know, last year, 2014, the number of real estate transactions, residential and commercial, and the value of real estate transactions in Tokyo metropolitan area surpassed that of New York and London. It is five times larger than any of the other Asian cities. So the metabolism of real estate is actually up. The second thing is labor. People talk about labor. It's like, oh my god, the labor market this, the labor market that. Well, again, look at the metabolism. The Japanese economy over the last 12 months has created, on average, every month, 130,000, 120,000 non-farm jobs. OK? America. Just to give you an example, to compare it, America has created on average about 200,000 non-farm jobs. Now, the base is very different. The American labor market, non-farm jobs, is about 140 million. So 140 million on an annual basis, 2.4 million jobs created, means that you've got a turnover of about 1.7%. Japan's non-farm payrolls is about 55 million, smaller than America, obviously. But you've created 1.4 million jobs over the last 12 months, which means it's actually a turnover of 2.5%. Now, quality, ooh, but they are the wrong jobs. They are part-time jobs. Excuse me, have you gotten a job in America lately? I mean, you know, the quality debate is all very nice and well, and we must have that debate, no question. You must have that debate in your company. But again, objectively speaking, when you look at the liquidity, when you look at the turnover, what do you see? Real estate transactions way up, human capital transactions way up, and in the world of money, I mean, what do I need to talk to you about? The world's largest pension fund, the GPIF, right, has just shifted from 60% JGB bond holdings towards basically 40%. When you look at the volume in the Japanese share market, again, it is at new record highs. So something is happening. The metabolism in this country is actually up. Different bracket. Remember this quote, right? <laughs> this is the key point, right? This is an absolute key point. It's like when you talk to your boss, right? Your boss tries to sort of do this, that, or the other to you. You say, bullshit, you know? 
this is the American way, right? <laughs> so just use your common sense. Why do I make this statement? Because what has Mr. Abe, what has Team Abe actually accomplished? And again, don't get lost in the three arrows. Focus on the reality. In 2013, when these people gained power, what did they do? They destroyed the old dogma of the Bank of Japan. The old Bank of Japan, and there is a quote, it's one of my favorite Japan quotes, from Governor Hayami. He was called in front of parliament as Japan was falling into recession and deflation. And he basically said, literally he said, we are doing everything we can, but trust me, it's not going to work. <laughs> wow, so much for central banking. Then why do you have a central bank? And you can prove this. We can have a long discussion about this. The Bank of Japan's philosophy has been fundamentally destroyed. They are doing quantitative easing. They have joined the global club of doing that, right? But for what has changed, this is an enormous achievement. The second thing, Abe was not just not nice to the Bank of Japan, he was also not nice to the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance has been spectacular in forcing Angela Merkel to look like a spendthrift, like a very spending person. The Ministry of Finance always wants to increase taxes, you know, and again, what did Abe do last autumn? He basically said, no increases in the consumption tax for the foreseeable future, which has caused him a lot of enemies in the Ministry of Finance, no question about that. But pragmatically speaking, it is the right thing to do for what I said earlier, allow the private sector, allow corporate Japan, allow consumer Japan to find their own ways without being jolted about by tax changes. And this is very, very important. And then, in my opinion, and I'm happy to debate this, in February this year, Prime Minister Abe and his team decapitated one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the world by decapitating Zenchu and Nokio. Now, he's a little nicer to the farmers than he was to the Ministry of Finance. The Ministry of Finance had to do away immediately with the tax hike. Of course, Nochu is only going to be disbanded, I think, one year before the Olympics, 2019. But there you go. From an institutional perspective, make no mistake, this country, this current leadership team is unbelievably pragmatic. There is no dogma. This is pragmatism at work. Now, I don't, I've been here for 30 years, and trust me, I mean, the one thing I did learn is that I'm not going to put all my eggs in the basket of a politician. I mean, what do I know? I mean, I happen to like these people from an economic perspective, right? But there are other aspects that I don't really like, and hey, Isun Sakiwayami, right? Three inches ahead, there is darkness, who knows? I think they will be around, but the real power of Japan, and you remember I've said that I've used this slide for the last 15 years. This is the most powerful asset that Japan has. Why do you invest in Japan? You invest in Japan because I've got what nobody else has got. I've got intellectual property. There never was a lost decade. If you look at research and developed spend, as a share in national income, structurally over the last generation, that has grown. Japan spends, you know, just about like Israel and Sweden and Finland, patents are us. Example, now I'm going to get into hot water because I know you guys do have some experts here, but I love the fact that a company called Fujifilm has an antidote to the Ebola virus. Now, why on earth a company like Fujifilm would do research on Ebola viruses, I have no idea. Why nobody commercialized this more aggressively? Well, here you are, that's your opportunity as business people, as global arbitrage, right? Japan does have intellectual property, does have a wealth of patents. Unlock those, commercialize those, sell it to the Germans, 
Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> and look, I mean, it's one of my favorite charts. Did you know that last year Japan came back to be the second largest shipbuilder um, you know, in the world again. And actually, my former employer, the analyst there, tells me that next year they're going to overtake Korea. Now, why this comeback? The reason is that shipbuilding, a 19th century type of enterprise, you may say, right? But still very important. What happened is that there's been a lot of kisei kyoka. There's been a lot of tightening of rules and regulation. Ships are stink pots. They emit a lot of CO2, so you gotta have eco-friendly ships. And Japan has invested in that technology and has actually made a great comeback in producing these, you know, Prius-type ships that now are gaining global market share. So again, I think it's very, very important just to remember, you know, that you've got this relentless focus on innovation, this relentless focus on, yes, investing in the future, and you do see concrete results of this actually starting to come through. Of course, the exchange rate does help. And do you know, do you know this? It's one of my favorite charts. This is why the TPP is going to happen. This is why agricultural liberalization is going to happen. It is now cheaper to produce rice in Japan than it is in the People's Republic of China. In yen terms, right? So it's quite interesting, you know, that you've got these sort of things. And then, of course, you know, real change. You talk about price adjustment. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. Japan is actually cheap. Look at the minimum wage. I think those of you who run companies here, definitely a new graduate from a good Japanese university comes at about half the rate that a good graduate from one of the American mediocre university comes, right? <laughs> Oh, but they're the wrong people. It's like, dude, that's your job. You're supposed to train them, right? So it's quite interesting that Japan has priced itself back into the global economy. And I'm very happy that in my world, the world of money, the great news is that the global money world is not showing any respect. Because actually, this is the price earnings ratio so, you know, the ratio between the stock price and the actual earnings power of companies in Japan. And you would have thought with all this hype about Abenomics, arrow number one, arrow number two, you would have thought, oh, there's a premium. But actually what has happened is that the price earnings multiple has come down in Japan. Japan is now a normal country. And actually it's trading at a discount to the United States of America. So if you need some stock advice, see me later. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's, it's very interesting. I mean, I spent literally, I spent 28 years of my life trying to justify why Japan deserves a premium. You know, why Japan should trade on a 30 times earnings multiple when American companies or German companies trade on a 14 times earnings multiple. And, and you know, you become very creative as an analyst. When you're young, it's, it's really good. You get very creative, you know? But you know, don't need to do that anymore. It's WYSIWYG. Right? Very, very interesting development here. Now, you may have noticed just a couple of weeks ago, the stock market capitalization actually climbed back up to the peak that we had at the peak of the Japanese bubble economy. It's basically 600 trillion yen. But look at the fundamental changes that have actually occurred. Cross shareholdings used to be half of the market was tied up in the Mitsui group, in the Sumitomo group, in the Mitsubishi group. Now we're down to 15%. And as of yesterday, we have a corporate governance code and the stewardship code where you as a company have to explain why you are owning cross shareholdings, which is very interesting. There may be some perfectly legitimate reasons for why you're doing this, right? Talk to the German companies, for example, right? There's cross shareholdings there. But the interesting thing is how much of a change has actually happened. Foreign ownership in Japan is up to basically one third. And importantly, of the trading of the metabolism in Japanese shares, you basically have two thirds of the trading being done you know, by global money managers. Earnings per share basically have gone up very nicely. Return on equity has gone up. 
And surprisingly, actually, since Japan supposedly is not creative, there is now more companies listed on the Japanese share market than there were at the peak of the bubble. So fundamental change has indeed happened. Now, bigger picture. You know, and I can, I'm going to do this, right, since actually on June 11th, it's my 30th anniversary of arriving in Japan, right? So I can now sort of say, oh, but what's different, right? And I can, hmm, you know, I've been here. Number one, it is regime certainty. For 30 years in Japan, there have been exactly two prime ministers who were in power for more than two years, Nakasone and Koizumi. Now, I don't care whether you like Abe or not, but chances are that he's going to be in power for another two to three years, right? And you and I as entrepreneurs, you and I as business people, we can discuss at the trader's bar or where do you go? You go somewhere more classy. Secret. Secret. She goes to secret. I know secret. Secret is good. <laughs> Good, is that the one in Azabujuban or it's the other secret? Okay. What? Shinjuku Nichome. <laughs> Debbie, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, but the point being, you know, that you've got, you can talk about politicians and their policies and their ideology until you're blue. You and I as entrepreneurs, you and I as businessmen, all we want is Angela Merkel. Sorry, all we want is somebody who stays the course, right? And Again, whether you like Abe and his team or not, I do not care. They are pro-business. Everything that they're trying to do is pro-business. They want to deregulate. Now, they should be deregulating more aggressively. But quite frankly, that depends who you are. If you are Mitsubishi, sorry, is there anybody here from Mitsubishi? <laughs> ah, no more. <laughs> it's more seven. <laughs> Mitsubishi is such a great company. <laughs> but they are an insider and they want to extract rent. You and I are outsiders. We want in, so we want faster and more aggressive deregulation. Well, I'm sorry, in any political economy, whether it's in America, whether it's in China, whether it's in Japan, there is friction. But these people here are definitely pro-business and they are here to stay. The other thing is this China bit, right? I mean, I do not say this lightly, but Japan now has a national project. People forget the stock market peaked. When did the stock market peak? It peaked when the Berlin Wall came down. All of a sudden, Japan was no longer relevant, right? The stock market bottomed when China attacked the Senkaku Islands, right? All of a sudden, Japan is relevant in the bigger scheme of things. We need to have a blockade against China. You can talk about this as much as you want, but the key point is the rivalry with the People's Republic of China is real. Japan's ruling elite does not want to become a colony of the People's Republic of China, and they know that to be taken seriously, you must have a strong economy. Just at the risk of dropping names, when Abe was elected to the president of the LDP, we had a little something, and we were this, that, or the other. And you know, at that point, it wasn't clear that they would participate in the TPP, right? And so I sort of said, look, I, I, I live in the money world. You know, I need to tell people that there's something concrete that you're doing, and TPP is the obvious one. And he looks me in the eyes. And I take off my glasses and start crying. No. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, you know, he looks in the eye and basically says, Kortan, TPP is not about agriculture. TPP is about my country being a member of the club that makes the global rules. Now, that is interesting. All of a sudden, you've got cojones, sorry, all of a sudden, you've got an ambition. So the animal spirits are absolutely back. And make no mistake, the integration, and if I've just redone the numbers, the integration of China and Japan in economic terms, when you look at people flow, when you look at capital flows, when you look at trade flows, the integration, the density of interaction between Japan and China is larger than the density between Germany and France or between England and America 
ever was over the last 50 years. It's quite remarkable how dense the relationship is. One number, 72% of the imports from the People's Republic of China into Japan, 72% are captured imports, are manufactured products made by Japanese companies, transplants, or joint ventures in China being pulled back into Japan. These economies are linked at the hip. The other favorite statistics I have is you now have 41% of the graduate students at Tokyo and Kyoto University who are Chinese nationals, which is quite interesting, which is, by the way, a very nice arbitrage. How much does it cost to study at Todai? It's basically $8,000. So, you know, as somebody who has a kid who's just about to go to college, you know, that's a significant discount to what you pay in the United States. So it's quite interesting that this arbitrage is happening. So that's the politics stuff of things, right? What about the economics? And the economics, the great thing is that Japan now is a deficit country. Let me repeat this. Having deficits is a good thing. Japan used to be what I call a trust fund babe. If you have a surplus, right, you can squander rates of return. You don't need to sweat your assets. You can be very generous. Japan now has a surplus savings. The most significant statistical change, economic change that has happened over the last three years is the fact that the household sector savings rate is now negative. Right? This is very important. This was long predicted because of the demographics. Today, one in four Japanese receives a pension. By 2025, one in three is going to receive a pension. This is natural, you receive a pension, you subsidize it by drawing down some of the savings and investments that you have. In the great debate about the GPIF, the, what is that thing called? The government public pension system, right? The unspoken truth is that even if the GPIF runs a rate of return of 7.5% every year, even with a 7.5% rate of return, they will be net cash out of about 2% of assets for the next 30 years, and in 33 years, they will have no assets left. So what does that mean? The pressure to sweat assets is rising. So all this stuff you hear about the corporate governance change, about the stewardship code, about Nippon Life, the world's largest, no, not the world's largest, that's no longer true. Um, what is that thing called? It's a, the Japan's largest insurance company, right? All of a sudden, them going to companies and saying, if you don't generate a rate of return, I'm going to vote against you. That is not political propaganda. That is not some ideology that somebody in Kasumigaseki has invented. It is driven by the hard economic facts of Japan actually having become a deficit country. This is very, very important to keep in mind. So sweating your assets harder, reorganizing your assets harder, that is exactly what's happening. And of course, you know, this is the corporate sector retained earnings. You know about this. Now, giving some of it back in terms of higher dividends, in terms of share buybacks, in terms of investment, you know, all of this stuff is now starting to happen because underneath it, you have a flow problem. Hmm. But this is my favorite part, actually. So you know, this, you, you know that I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. <laughs> I mean, this, this is very important, right? And the reason, again, comes back to scarcity, right? The number of high school and university graduates in this country is going to decline every year by 225,000 between now and the Tokyo Olympics. So I want to be a young Japanese and you see that as a result of this now, the demand for labor is beginning to change. Prediction, Japan, in my opinion, Japan will be the only, <laughs> outside of Bavaria, um, will be the only advanced industrial economy where there will be a new middle class. I'm absolutely convinced by that. And the reason is that when you look at the labor market in Japan, 
you do see the overall tightness. You're well familiar with that. So there's excess demand relative to supply. But the labor market over the last 30 years changed. The salaryman is dead, right? Today, 40% of the people who receive a paycheck are part-time workers or contract worker. They're he say right? 1995, that was only 20%. Lifetime employment, full-time employees have dropped from 40% to 20%. It was the big change that has actually occurred in the overall system. Now what is happening because the labor market is in tight supply, and now why you should not be learning Chinese but Japanese, right, um, is exactly the fact that these people are being arbitraged back into full-time employment. And you're seeing this with some of the leading companies uh, Yanai San, what is that company called? Uniqlo Fast Retailing, right? You had Hitachi, you had NTT, Aeon Group, more and more people are hiring back part time workers, contract workers on a full time basis. Now, what is the difference between a part time worker and a full time worker? There is two plus one bonus. Two economic facts. The first one is money. Right? If you're a part-time worker, if it depends a little bit by industry, but your non-wage benefits, your pension and health insurance, basically averages out to be about 15% below what it is for a full-time worker. On top of that, in money, as a part-time worker, you have no access to a bonus. And in Japan, for a full-time worker, the bonus is about 35% of annual income. So basically what is happening is that your annual income goes up by 50%. The second thing that happens is, if you're a part-time worker, love or money does not buy you credit. You cannot get a credit card from Oryx, and you certainly cannot get a mortgage from any of the Japanese banks. Once you become a full-time worker, you're eligible, and all of a sudden you've got income, plus you've got access to leverage. Then you've got the bonus point. What's the bonus point? The bonus point is very simple. It's like, and, and I apologize for, um, so, so Japanese, well, uh, the, the, the Japanese are very smart, right? As a part-time worker, you can get a date, but you cannot get married. As a full-time worker, you will get married, right? And you're actually seeing, and I'm sorry that I didn't bring the data, you actually see an inflection in marriage rates and when marriage rates go up, what's going to happen is you're going to have a baby boom, right? So, you know, the virtuous cycle of this new middle class actually being generated. And this is very important. It's the key investment thesis for Japan. Japan's exporters, Japan's car companies, electronics companies, chemical companies, all these guys who are dependent on the global business cycle, you don't need to be in Japan to invest in these companies. What is happening in Japan is we are seeing the development of an endogenous domestic demand cycle, of a cycle that is independent of what happens to the global economy. And that's this labor market dynamics that you're actually seeing. Now, I've had this thesis for a couple of years. Now I can actually show you data that this is beginning to happen. If you look at volume, number of people employed, you see that full-time employment is actually starting to grow. Part-time employment is still growing 3%, but full-time employment is now growing at one, one and a quarter percent. That will be picking up. And then on top of that, pay, you actually do see that now, the bottom chart here, you actually do see that full-time pay is also beginning to increase. So the bottom line is, you know, you've got something very powerful. And again, you know, look at this. If you're a graduate of a Japanese university, basically 97% of the kids now have a job, and by the way, they have no debt, which is kind of nice. There's no student debt in this country. Uh, in America, it's $1.4 trillion of debt, where the average you know, uh, university graduates now needs 18 years to pay off the student debt. So we shall see. Um, anyway, Japan is rich, lots of money, right? This is the net assets. Um, so what you're going to see is that you know, the old people, as they retire, they're going to draw down their savings and they want the creature comforts, which is where the jobs for the young are going to be coming from. And you know, the interesting thing is, 
that you actually find something quite amazing. And now I'm going to get emotional. Ha! This country has never broken its social contract. The baby boom generation, which is basically give or take 21% of the population, what did they do? The baby boom generation graduates in the early 80s, starts their jobs in the, uh, you know, in the early 80s. They get married and take out a mortgage in the mid to late 80s. And then they see their real estate value collapse, right? So they've had negative equity, right? And they had to pay back all that debt that was taken out. But never once were they fired. Never once did the bank actually foreclose on them. The debt was paid back. It was kurushi. It was a balance sheet recession. But now that debt has actually been paid off. And one of my favorite statistics on Japan is that 45% of the Japanese who are over the age of 20 have no debt, no credit card debt, no consumer installment debt, no student debt, no mortgage debt. But those 45% own the home that they live in. Do you know what the number is in America? 5.8%. Exactly right. You know, so in America, you want to be a banker. In Japan, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It's like, God, you know, we can get into trouble here. Uh, great. So we are in this consumer speech world. Now, one thing I want to do last, because you remember last time you asked me about the public debt and how can we solve that? And I basically said, well, I'm just not going to talk about this because this is terribly complicated. So what I want to do <laughs> is try and do the impossible and basically show you that it is actually possible you know, to fix the fiscal deficit in Japan. OK, so apologi sorry, this is a lot of numbers, so I, I apologize for that. Right? What this is, this looks at the fiscal position, um, you know, total spending and total revenues, and where that all come from. And it looks at the average as a share of national income of the various line items coming through there. And then over the last you know, 35 years, you know, what was the high and what was the low of the various items? Okay? And you can see that on average this country has run fiscal deficits of about 5.5% of GDP. Right? Now, how do I balance the budget? Well, the easiest way would be if just arithmetically, if I go back to the high over the last 30 years on the revenue side, and if I go to the low on the expenditure side, I would actually run a surplus. Now, OK, that's, I think, my two-year-old dog can probably do that, that sort of calculation. Now, how realistic is this? And what is the realistic case? And this is what I will throw out to you there, you know, for you to, to just have a think about it. Right? If you look at expenditure cuts, right, social welfare is going to be increasing just because of the health expenditure that's coming through. But if you, you know, move this thing you know, to about 5% of GDP, anyway, you can, you can read this for yourself. It is possible, it is not at all impossible to move towards a fiscal sustainable position in Japan. The amount of debt is still going to be very high. But that's true everywhere else in the world as well. But it is certainly not bizarre to assume that you can fix this. And actually, this is where Abenomics is running a hidden agenda that nobody likes to talk about. 2000, I mean, you know Piketty? You know this guy who's like, hello, I'm Karl Marx, and you know, there's inequality, and we need to fix it. Um, you know, which is, which is great. He's French. What can I say? Um, you know, but, but no, but in all seriousness, I mean, these are serious issues, as you know, right? But Japan is one of the few countries where they're actually doing some stuff about it. 2014, last year, we doubled the capital gains tax to 20%, right? We also increased the top income tax bracket. People talk about the VAT hike from 5 to 8. Oh, my God, that's terrible. Sorry. Of income tax revenues, 70% are generated from the top income tax bracket. It's going to be very interesting because at the end of July, beginning of August, the Ministry of Finance will publish the data how much money, how much tax revenue was actually collected. We don't know right now because we have a new tax system. 
right? So it's going to be very, very interesting to see the surpluses that are actually going to be accumulated. As you know, this year, Japan is increasing the inheritance tax rate. And also, you know, there's, an, uh, there's a, um, what is it called? Uh, uh, the exit tax, you know, is actually starting to come through as well. So, you know, and then there's, of course, the my number introduction that is starting to come through. The other thing that nobody likes to talk about is that Mr. Abe, but I don't want to sound like I completely praise these people. I think that as a German, there's some very uncomfortable issues, you know, with, with what these people have, right? But on economic policy side, again, pension reform. Japan had fully indexed pension, which is to say that your pension benefit was going up next year by the rate of inflation that we had in the previous year. Mr. Abe has reformed this. We now have a macro slide. So instead of full indexation, you are going up by only two thirds. On top of that, they have an overpayment cut. In the periods of deflation, pensions never declined. That is now being clawed back. What that actually means, last year's inflation was 2.8%. Cutting back one third, and they have some committee that decides, they actually decided it would be 1%, right? So instead of going up by 1.8%, pensions are going up 1.8, minus one, minus half a percent. That minus half a percent is at infinitum, right? It doesn't end in 2020 or something like that. So the cuts are actually starting to happen. What does that mean? This will save the government about three quarters of a percent of GDP. And it's the only country where pension reform is actually happening. Of course, in my home country, Germany, uh, Ms. Merkel has gone the other way around. They have just changed the pension age. You no longer have to retire when you're 65. In Germany, you now have to retire when you're 63. You know, but anyway, there you go. See what the euro crisis does to the economy. Anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, lots of things that we can talk about, lots of things that we can discuss, but what do you have, I think, is very clear. You've got an excellent cyclical position. You've got a structural position where the government is stable and is pro-business. You've got a wealth of intellectual property. You've got an economy that is repriced into the global system. And you've got a domestic dynamics that actually allows you to decouple from the rest of the world doesn't get any better than that. Now you understand, I think, why I want to set up my own company. Thank you very much. We will uh, open the floor up for questions. If you could give your name and identify your organization and wait for the mic to come to you as well. Thank you very much. Kasper, as always, uh, yes, I should say as always. Uh, I don't know if I've been here for all 15, but I've been here for quite a lot of them and uh, always exciting. Greg's story from Dale Carnegie Training. You didn't mention immigration. Now, we've had this discussion before. I wonder if your views on this have advanced on previous views or what your thinking is about the Abe's government's policy here. Certainly the pressure from the business community is strong to have it. Where do you think we're going to go with immigration? Because that will have a big impact, I imagine, on a lot of those things you're projecting as far as the yep. uh, employment cycle goes. It's, it's a very, very important point. Um, now, um, when you cut through the emotional stuff and just look at the data, what do you see? Five years ago in Tokyo, the greater Tokyo area, Five years ago, 3.1% of people receiving a paycheck were non-Japanese. Today, it is 5.4%. I will not advise any politician to openly advocate immigration, because quite frankly, nobody knows what that means anymore. America, immigration certainly, is a very hot topic. Go to Singapore, right, where it's a very hot topic. But Japan is very pragmatic in its immigration policy. You've seen some of the visa you know, regulations that have actually changed, right? The trainee visas are coming through. I always have to tell the story, you know, when I arrived in Japan in 1985, as a graduate student, I was allowed to work for 12 hours a week. Today, 
on a student visa, you're allowed to work for 38 hours a week, which is three hours more than a Frenchman. <laughs> you know, so, so, but, it, but, but again, you know, and you can, say, you can say, oh, this is not an immigration policy. It's like, why not? It's great pragmatism that actually is starting to come through, right? So, um, you know, I hear you. Right? But I think that, that actually the progress you know, is quite good. You look at, you know, again, the utilization of labor is, is incredibly the way that's changing. Right? And my most bullish point about Japan was when your friend, the guy who runs Japan's largest, largest industrial employer, Hitachi Corporation. Is there anybody here from Hitachi? It's a great company. It's a great company. No, but the guy is seriously fantastic, right? Um, but anyway, he, in October last year, announced that for 16,000 of their senior managers, now, never mind, why do they have 16,000 senior managers? But that's it. But, but, you know, Seika Shugi, right? That for 16,000 of the senior managers of Japan's largest industrial company, right, they're going to be shifted towards pay for performance. So we had a drink and you know, I said, well, this is brilliant. This is, I love this. This is awesome, right? But tell me, Nakamura-san, how does this actually work? What are you thinking? He's like, oh, of course. Let's have another drink, OK? Have another drink. <laughs> this is, you know, again, why do you like Japan? It's, they have another drink. You know, this is good, right? Of course, I drink mineral water, you know, all these things. Um, so contractually, those 16,000, uh, currently get a bonus of 4.3 months of pay, right? And we're going to change this. We're going to quintile them. And the top quintile is going to get seven months, and the bottom quintile is going to get two months. And you look at this, wow, if this really happens, and they're only starting this year, so it needs to be verified. But at the great house of JP Morgan, which is a financial services company, Basically, unless you're like some superstar up there in New York in the private jet, right? Um, you basically, you know, we quintile people, which is similar to what everybody else does. And basically, you know, the top quintile, if you're lucky, you get 12 months of pay, and the bottom quintile gets zero. So moving to a spread two to seven for an industrial company? Wow, if that really happens. So it's that sort of relocation of labor. That sort of incentive structure changing. Toyota Corporation uh, in February this year announced that for 40% of their full-time employees, they're going to be shifted towards Seikashugi. So it's that reallocation, that incentivization, that makes me very excited. Because you've got economists talking about, ooh, Japan needs productivity. Ooh, Japan, yes, really, Japan needs productivity. I'm sure, yes, and we need clean air too. Right? I mean, it's, it's a meaningless, it's actually productivity is the residual, it's the stuff you econometrically cannot explain with anything else, right? So why are we so focused on a residual, right? But management-wise, when you run a company, being incentivized, right, for better performance, for more productive performance, if that starts to fall into place, it gets very, very exciting. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer to what was the question? <laughs> please. Thanks. I'm Scott Head. I'm an economist for a subsidiary of Toyota. Uh, just actually a small question. Uh, you were mentioning You're an economist for the subsidiary of Toyota. Yeah. Fantastic. You like that? Excellent. <laughs> uh, just a small question. Toward the end, you were talking about the um, uh, inheritance tax. Yeah. And I had, in my mind, always thought of it as a as a bad thing. But you were so so. How do I how do I think about that for the implications for the growth of the new middle class that you're talking about? What what's the relationship between kind of I guess the I I've been thinking it was okay. You know how you know households getting smaller and smaller, but you know. It's, it's a very interesting point. So the, so the effective rate is being increased. The top, there's, there's various brackets, right? The top bracket is being bumped up, right, from 50 to 55 percent. At the same time, what is happening is that the deductibility, right, for transferring over two generations, right, is actually being increased, right? And that is actually particularly true for real estate, 
where your deductibility basically has been doubled, right? So the issue of unstucking the generational wells, which is, I mean, it's not a surprise that the old, I mean, it's not a surprise that your father has more money than you do, right? Um, but that unstucking, right, by increasing the penalty, but at the same time increasing the incentives to build a home for your daughter or for your grandchild. Now, sorry, i tell you a funny anecdote on this. In this stupid Shingikai, right, in, in this government advisory council, right, there was like this whole inheritance tax thing and yadi da, and it's all complicated, blah, 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 right? And then we said, sort of, oh, you know, but you should give incentives to do the generational transfer, right? And so the guy from the Ministry of Finance who is responsible for all the data, he sort of rushes out, right, as they do, and then he sort of rushes back in with like a folder of this size, you know, and sort of leaves through the whole thing. You know what the average age is of somebody who receives inheritance? 67. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so, so I mean, you've, you've got, I mean, age is fantastic, right? As, as you know, the older you get, the, the better it gets, right? But so you've, you've got to skip a generation. <laughs> Because obviously it's, it's not, anyway, so, so it's quite interesting, you know, that they've actually tried, you know, to incorporate, uh, uh, you know, to incorporate that, right? Goes on. Uh, Charles McGill with Second Harvest Japan. I love your enthusiasm, your optimism. It's, it's really infectious. I have a question, so more related to the poverty rate, because some of the data that you presented here really presents kind of a negative thing. I mean, out of the poverty rate right now in Japan is at relatively 16%. And out of that 20 million people, only 7,500 are homeless. That's actually halved in the last five years. Right. The low savings is an indication of that, that more and more people are finding it struggling to get by. The higher number of people are part-time. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Because, I mean, personally, I don't know, is it really at 16% or not? If it is, you know, why aren't more people talking about this? Because one out of six, you know, living on less than 100,000 yen a month is a fairly large number. Right, right. Look, I mean, there's, there's no question that, you know, and again, I don't want to play statistical games, right? But these poverty rates are deviations from medium income, right? Um, you know, so if your medium income goes up, and, you know, so it's not a zettai gaku, right? It's not, it's not an absolute comparison. But the point is absolutely true which is just a function of aging. In Japan, the pension replacement, so the amount of pension that you receive is effectively 50% of your average income over the last five years, right? Which is actually lower than the OECD average. Now, the fact that there are people who have fell, who have fell between the crack working for Chushu Kigyo who went bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera, who basically live on social security, you're absolutely right. So there are cracks in the system, absolutely no question, and those cracks in the system, because of the aging, are going to get more pronounced. I mean, this, 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 have you seen this stuff about Alzheimer? I mean, the Alzheimer stuff is really cool. If, if the incident rate of Alzheimer continues, and Japanese longevity continues to expand along the ways that it has over the last 10 years, you basically find that you know, by the year 2040, one in three Japanese is going to have Alzheimer's. Right? So it's, 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 you know, so you've, you've got issues, you know, that are, that are actually starting to come through there. Dozo. I've always had the notion that the uh, so-called lost decades have really been uh, decades during which Japan has integrated itself into the uh, international economy. Um, I'm wondering, as we move forward, um, we, if we see interest rates rise in the United States, um, and uh, Japanese want to shift out of Japanese debt into North American debt. Yeah. Will that be allowed to happen? Yeah. What's going what's to happen? I, I think the answer is, will it be allowed to happen? The answer is absolutely yes. And the whole issue, I mean, you know, is you know, free capital mobility, right, remaining at the forefront of the political agenda. And the reason is not Japan, it's not America, the reason is the People's Republic of China. Right? The big issue is the People's Republic of China. China wants to become the reserve currency of the world. Right? That, I mean, th this is what will happen. I mean, sorry, this, this is what will happen. Right? The question is how long is it gonna take? 
all this squabble that you've got now with the IMF going on is about fine, you've got to deregulate, you've got to liberalize your capital markets, right? If you did that, what happened? Right? I mean, the, end, the, the renminbi would probably depreciate massively because, as you know, the problem with China is that there's 1.3 billion people, but they all want to get out. While the problem with Japan is that there's 125 million people, they all want to stay here. Um, you know, no, but, you know, but, but so you've, you've, you've got that issue. You know, so impeding free capital flow between, you know, across the Pacific, I think is very, very unlikely to happen. Right? But at the same time, the pressure point really is towards the savings from the, from the People's Republic of China. Because the savings right now are entrapped in China, have no rate of return, which is why they had the development of a shadow banking system, which they're now trying to squish out. Right? So how is that going to be unfolding, I think is really going to be the big, big story. That you, that, that you and I actually are going to have to f uh, uh, follow over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. It's actually going to happen faster, in my opinion. Please. Hi, I'm Scott Foster from uh, TAP Japan. Uh, hello. Hey, Scott. Where did I see you last time? You're looking good. Across the table, I think. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah you talked about part-time and full-time workers. Yeah. Um, I was working for the uh, government of Tokyo. Yep for a while on the uh, Olympic preparations uh, uh, that are ongoing. She stayed there for about six months. She told me that uh, the agency that placed her there was taking 30% of her gross salary. Yep. Not once. You know, in finance, maybe the headhunter takes one month's salary yep. once. But 30% of her gross salary every month she was there. Yep. So what I'd like to know is how typical is this? Right. And if it is a standard, what is the impact on consumption considering the large number of temporary workers in Japan? Right. No, look, uh, it varies a little bit. My understanding is I'm not, a, I'm not a temp agent expert, right? It varies a little bit from agency to agency, but for all intents and purposes, it's a bit like a dango, like, you know, most of the other stuff, right, uh, uh, that you've got. So, you know, the fact that there is a, you know, a, a big drain, a big, you know, uh, 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 you know tax, you know, from the agency is absolutely no question. Now, the point I would make, right, again, no question this is what, what, what we had in the past. Again, the point I would make, and the reason for why I'm so optimistic, is that you don't need these agencies anymore. You can find jobs by yourself, right? Because Japanese corporations are looking for companies. Do you have the talent to actually deliver something to, whether it's Hitachi Corporation or you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever corporation? You know, that's a completely different issue. But I think that you know, the, the shift from the part-time employment, which we had in reality over the last 30 years, no question, right? That shift towards more full-time employment, right? That is exactly. And when you actually follow the labor market debate in Japan, the labor market debate is not about firing some 62-year-old guy who's been on lifetime employment. The labor market debate is about hiring back part-time workers on a full-time basis, but having a deguchi clause, having an exit strategy there, should business conditions turn down, I can actually make you redundant on an agreed package. Because as you know, the problem with Japan's redundancy packages is that there is no standard, right? You do not know, is it one month of pay for every year that you worked, right? It needs to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case individual basis. So that's where the labor market reform is actually happening. But for all intents and purposes, I mean, sorry, since I'm always so bullish on Mr. Abe, I don't think that there's much happening you know, uh, uh, on, on that front. right? So the shortage in the labor market right, is really the big driver that we've got right now. Dozo. Thank you for another amazing talk. Uh, Dave Clement, uh, Oracle Corporation. I think this is my 12th session of uh, watching you dance up there. In what? case, uh, uh, unless I miss my guess, you seem bullish on Japan? No, 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 I'm just, I'm realistic. I'm, I'm German. Putting your money where your mouth we're not, we're is. We're not bullish. To put your money where your mouth is, how do we capitalize on that? How, what is the investment strategy going Oh, I've going got forward? this great company that I'm setting up. I mean, we, we, <laughs> we, we've got the stuff you want to buy. Trust me, we've got it. 
and you're looking for How do you capitalize it? It's, it's very interesting because, I mean, again, what I, I actually think finance is a phenomenal business opportunity in Japan, right? Um, and the reason is that, you know, what, what, when you th remember I talked about the unstuckiness, the metabolism, right? So real estate is happening. Cap rates have compressed. You know, I don't know whether you, now you're waiting for rents to go up. I, I'm not sure I would, you know, sort of rush into Japanese real estate right now, right? Um, you know, if you look at, you know, financial services sort of standard stuff in terms of corporate advisory, right? A lot of the changes there, I mean, you know, FANUC, has just increased its payout ratio to 80%. I mean, what am I going to do now? I mean, like, you know, ooh, it needs to be at 100%. It's like, well, maybe, you know? But so a lot of the unlocking in the corporate world is starting to happen. The stuff that hasn't happened yet, and that's my big bet, the stuff that will happen now is Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, right? In the money world, yeah, foreigners are buyers of the stock market. Domestic financial institutions are now buyers of the stock markets, right? But Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe is still a seller of the stock market, right? That actually changing, right? That's, I think, the big, the, the big opportunity that you're going to be getting. The other opportunity set is very simple. I mean, you've heard me say this a thousand times. I still do want to build the Louis Vuitton hospital chain of Japan. I mean, you know, creature comforts for the old is a spectacular business. Now you've got to fight the government. It's highly regulated, like it is everywhere else. The other thing I find superbly, superbly awesome, where has there been the most concrete deregulation drive that you have ever seen in Japan? Pharmaceuticals, right? The change in the drug approval process has been unbelievable. It used to take, on average, 11 years right, for a drug to get approval. Now there are 19 drugs by global pharmaceutical companies where Japan is first to market. Right? The second thing is the deregulation of regenerative medicine and stem cell. Japan is on top of the world right, in the way that has been deregulated. Right? And it's very, very interesting. I mean, you, 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 it's complicated because you know, Japan has excellent intellectual property protection. I mean, you and I doing stem cell research or something applied medicine, regenerative medicine in Korea or God forbid in China, I mean, we, we don't own the asset, right? In Japan, we own the asset. There's no question about that. And the other thing is, and this I don't say lightly because I don't want to offend people here, but Japan has no problem playing God, right? So, on Tuesday, last week, a week ago, so I'm a judge of this thing called, sorry, I'm just gonna gossip for 30 seconds because I was thrown away. I mean, I just, wow, my future, our future is safe. The kids are cool. Do you koto. So four years ago, there's a professor at Todai, right, um, who started this network and he, he, he invented this thing called the Asia Entrepreneurship Award, right? And so there is you know, competitions in Malaysia, in Thailand, in China, in Korea, in Japan. And so they bubble up. And the top two teams, they invite to Tsukuba, right? Um, and for one week, right, they do their little thing. And actually, Mike Alfland, uh, you know, and myself, we are judges you know, on this thing, right? Unbelievable. So for the first time in four years, there's a Japanese team that won, right? You know what they do? They 3D print organs. It's unbelievable. And so it's like, well, whoa, what do I know about this stuff? It's like, look, you know, there's one company in San Diego that does this, top secret, or very, you know, they, they use the scaffolding method, right? So they build a scaffolding, and then they drop in the stem cells, right? And then sort of eventually they sort of mesh together and they start to grow, right? This guy uses what I then termed the yakitori method, right? <laughs> so he's got a, a needle, and he puts the stem cells onto the needle, because of that, the nutrients, the stuff that needs to feed these things, has much greater access. So basically, he's three times faster than the guy in San Diego. So he's grown this stuff, right, this company. And so they've grown tangents, they've grown vessels, they've grown a liver. They've printed liver. <laughs> I mean, spooky stuff. Look, it's, I'm German, I get this, right? <laughs> Well, that was that was not good. <laughs> but, okay, but no, but but you know, so it's it. I mean, wow, 
And you ask the guys, like, I know nothing about this business, right? You ask the guys, like, how long is this going to take until you start to implant this? And he basically says two to three years. And he was a Japanese guy. He's not some swashbuckling salesperson. He's like some guy from Torah. He's like a geek. He practically had braces. <laughs> <laughs> well. But it's like, wow, 3D printing of organs. You've got to be kidding me. You know what the scary password? And you sit like completely nonchalant. And of course, the tangents we grow are 5.3 times more durable and strong than anything humans grow. OK. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> anyway, so, so, you know, so you've got you know, sort of regenerative medicine, right? This is the one part when, I, and there are experts here in this room in the pharmaceuticals industry. I mean, this thing is on fire. And obviously, the whole story about the test market, you know, I am getting old faster, right? I do need these creature comforts. I will, as the government, actively sponsor to get cheaper access, whether it's Medicare, whether it's medication, you know, or whether it is limps and things like that, right? So anyway. So depending on the length of Jesper's next response, we have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> and Debbie has already so, commandeered a Thanks microphone. very much. Debbie Howard of the Carter Group and the ACCJ. Um, fellow, uh, fellow Centera. <laughs> yes, fe fellow third So year. she and I, we arrived in Japan practically together. Of course, you know, she was dating some handsome <laughs> Japanese guy at the time. Um, but she arrived also 30 years ago in June. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's been a great ride as well. And I love hearing, I think as, as we all do, your optimistic view of Japan. And not to end on a downer, but I'm sure no. you've looked at both sides. And so uh, I'd love to hear your opinions of some of the risks yeah. and downsides um, as an entrepreneur here. Yeah. A fellow entrepreneur now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, okay, there's, there's, there's a thousand risks, right? And, you know, what I want to try and do is, I mean, the... the I'm not going to talk about earthquakes. I'm not going to talk about America having a recession because there's a 1,000 people who can do that, right? I see two risks, right? The first one is domestic, and the second one is international, OK? So the domestic risk is that I am right on the labor market, that indeed the labor market is very tight, right? That everybody gets rehired on a full-time basis, but that Actually, Japan runs out of labor much faster than I'm prepared to admit right now. Because quite frankly, I cannot have my cake and eat it. It's a problem with economists. Ooh, incomes are going to go up by 50%. Well, the guy who employs that person, his costs have just gone up by 50%. You really think your productivity is going to go up by 50%? So margin squeezes on domestic companies is one of the risks. Now, I do not think this is an issue for listed companies, right? Because listed companies can buy up the labor assets. So I predict that actually this year and next year, we will see a wave of mergers where companies get acquired for labor, right? Interesting statistics. Since January the 1st, there is 3,890 retail outlets in Tokyo that have gone bankrupt, right? And they went bankrupt because of the labor shortage, because they couldn't cope with the pay increases that are now starting to come through. But what that means is that Aeon Group, or Takashimaya, or whoever, or 7-Eleven, now has access to the assets, to the real estate assets, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the one risk is that, indeed, you get cost push inflation in the system because the labor market is actually very, very tight, OK? The second risk international is China. But it's not the standard China thing. Because people say, oh, China used to grow 10%. Now it's growing 7%. Oh my god, it's slowing down. I don't care. I'm Japanese. China slowing down is good for me. Because China growing too fast means what? high commodity prices. I am an importer of commodities. So commodity prices going down because China is slowing down is bad news for Brazil, yes. Bad news for Australia, absolutely. Great news for Japan, right? No question about that. My worry is the policy response from the Communist Party to a slowdown in China. To be specific. China is run 
to maintain the power of the Communist Party. The single most important data point in the world, right, where are we? In Asia Pacific, is Chinese employment. If Chinese unemployment starts to grow, the risk and temptation for China to devalue the currency is going to be very high. And trust me, you and I do not want to be long the Tokyo stock market when China devalues the currency. When currency wars come to Asia because of Chinese pressures, that would be a problem, right? So I'm going to end on a gossip note. So I went to school with a guy who pretends to be the deputy governor of the People's Bank of China. Right? So we're like having whatever one has in Beijing, right? Um, and you know, we're sort of talking about you know, this sort of stuff, right? And so he looks me in the eye, and this kampai, right? Or kampai, or whatever they say. Uh, you know, and, and, and sort of says, but Jesper, you've got to remember, we want to be German, not French. <laughs> Which is to say, the French used to devalue their currency all the time, right? And basically had a good life. The Germans never devalued, right, and had a fantastic life. Ah, sorry, no. <laughs> no, but you know, so, so this becomes an issue, right? This becomes a very, very big issue. So China devaluing and trigger for devaluation would be the fact that indeed your unemployment rate is starting to go up because that would destabilize the political regime. So that's the one thing that I'm worried about. So I think that that's a problem you know, probably for after, you know, Japan wins the World Cup, something like that. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, I wish you all the greatest of success. Um, this is a fantastic place. Don't be shy. Uh, if you do want to contact me, um, it's uh, jesper at japanoptimist.com. Thank you. Thank you.